Don't do it on social media. Don't make ultimatums. Be adults, do it behind closed doors, and you get a fight done. This is Jonathan Agger, Fifth Pro Boxing Fans, joined by journalist Dan Raphael at what you called in your substat the most important fight of the year uh, so far. But first of all, how's your week in Vegas been? It's been good. I got here Wednesday. It's hot as hell and it's tiring, but it's a lot of fun. And if you're involved in boxing in any capacity, how are you not here? I mean, it's the biggest. I mean, let me, as you mentioned, it's the most significant fight of the year. When I and I don't mean it's not the, it's not the biggest fight because when I think biggest, I mean in terms of like how big's the pay per view, how big's the money involved. It's the best fight on paper in the year. It's the most significant fight of the year. But it, in my opinion, we'll see what happens. It won't surpass the money generated by what happened with Tank Davis and Ryan Garcia here back in April. And probably the same as if we see, say, uh, even like an Anthony Joshua and a Deontay Wilder at the end of the year, even maybe Fury and Naganu and fights along those lines. But this is, in terms of historical significance, it's the most important fight of this year. Uh, I saw you speaking to Errol after the press conference. I don't, I don't know if you spoke to Terence, but what did you what did you gauge from both of them after the press conference? Yeah, I had a chance to talk a little bit to both of them, not like in-depth interviews. They were kind of going down the row and had to stop to talk to us for a few minutes. Uh, one thing I, it seems to me, and I know we're still a day as we tape this, a day before the weigh-in. Errol looks like he get, he's ready to fight tomorrow or tonight, whatever. Looks in sharp, you know, on weight, looks good. I don't think he's going to have... A, a really bad time with the weight cut. In Errol, you could kind of get the feeling he's a little sunken, a little slower. He's, he's suffering right now to make the weight. And uh, he's done it for years, and I'm sure he'll do it like a pro. But you could definitely tell, having spoken to each of them in the span of just a few minutes, that one guy is not uh, probably where he needs to be at the moment, and the other guy is. People saying this is, you know, A1 or A+, a plus, both of them at the same level. So what, what does this come down to in the end? I've thought about that quite a bit. I mean, it is that kind of fight where I still am not sure who I'm going to pick for the fight. I'm going to have to make a pick because I do a gambling show on Friday. So I'm going to have to make the pick on that one. Uh, so what does it come down to? I mean, they're, they're so close in every facet that you would make a laundry list of attributes. Whatever your list is, they check all those boxes. So I keep thinking to myself that when it gets deep and deep in the fight, if it goes that far, which I suspect that it will, obviously it comes down to who's got the bigger heart. Who's, who's, but I always think about like who's the nastier, meaner guy, who really has got the more dog. And it's not that Errol doesn't have that in him. I think that maybe a little bit more Crawford does. So if there's one thing that maybe tips the balance, that did, he's just meaner and nastier. And uh, just finally, you know, on, <clears throat> on the press conference, uh, sort of got a bit uh, agitated both fighters. Is that just in your experience seeing that due to the weight cut and things like that? Or is it just such a significant fight that was bound to happen at some point? Well, I think the fighters actually were very respectful of each other. Really, what, what got things riled up more was that not between Errol and Terrence. I mean, there was a little bit back and forth. But it was mainly because the Errol team, the, his group, his family, his friends who were sitting in the front couple of rows, they were shouting things at Crawford, and Crawford's people were shouting stuff at Errol. The difference was that Errol, at least my recollection, was he just sort of let it roll off his back and really didn't say anything. Terrence, after a while, was getting annoyed and started chirping back at them, and then it sort of degenerated. But other than that, the two fighters, uh, you know, they had their say, but they were pretty respectful of each other. What I didn't really care for, frankly, was the, 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 the back-and-forth nastiness between... Brian McIntyre and, and Derek James, the two trainers, you know, they're great trainers and they've done their jobs for a long time and helping prepare these great athletes and great champions for their fights. But you're not the ones getting in the ring, so shut up at the, you know, say your stuff about the fight, but don't be cursing back and forth with the other trainer and be littling the other trainer and saying the things that they were saying. I just think that that was called, I didn't think that was called for. Uh, just uh, moving on to a few other fights we've got coming up in the UK, uh, Joshua against Dillian White. Uh, when you first heard that was announced, uh, were you happy? Were you like you don't care or what would you think I, I mean I like the fight I don't I don't really quite get why people are so down on it because if it was the end all be all fight then you'd be like oh that's disappointing but everybody knows it's positioned as with a win he's going to fight yet a third time either well either a third time at the end of this year or at the very beginning of next year but it will be three fights within less than 12 months um 
and that it's going to be the Wilder fight. So what's everybody getting on his case? Their first fight between him and Dillian was an excellent matchup. He, I, I'm glad he's not sitting around just waiting for that Wilder fight. So, you know, he's sort of damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. On the one hand, the fans want to see the big fights, but they don't want to take a fight in between. Well, be happy Joshua's going to fight, like I said, three times probably, if he wins, obviously, in the span of less than a year. And Dillian White, I know he got beat up uh, and, and, and knocked out by Tyson Fury, but he's still a good heavyweight. He's still got history with uh, Anthony Joshua. He's still going to come to fight, in my opinion. I think what aggravates more people than just the matchup is, at least in the UK, it's a pay-per-view. And that's kind of got people a little bit uh, annoyed. You know, here in, Amer in America and the rest of the world, it's just part of your regular DAZN subscription. But I'll just say all to the people that are upset because it's on pay-per-view, how many fights have we had here in America that we have on pay-per-view that are part of your regular subscription in Britain? Sort of the same thing. You're just the other way around for this one. Now, one thing I'm sure fans would like to hear your opinion on is uh, this back and forth between uh, Joshua and Carl Froch. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but Joshua made comments suggesting that Robert McCracken, he gave too many years to him. Obviously, Robert McCracken, long-time trainer of Carl Froch, uh, he, he wasn't happy with the comments and things like that. What have you made of it uh, as an outsider looking in? I'm sure I'm sure you know both over the years, but what, what did you make of it? Because it was quite a big story in the UK last week. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I understand Carl. Carl, he, he worked with Rob for a long time and has a lot of respect for him. They won a lot of big fights together, and he was defending his guy. And uh, and if you and I known Carl for many years, Carl's not the kind of guy that's not going to open his mouth when he's got something to say. Carl's not the guy to just sort of you know let stuff roll off his back, if you know what I mean. And I don't even mean that in a bad way. I like Carl. I mean, he, look, he'll be the first to say Carl and I had our back and forth over the years. Uh, that wasn't always pleasant, but uh, you know, n not an issue now. Obviously, and we're friendly. And whenever I see him, he's I think Carl's a great guy. I think he's a great fighter, and I was happy to vote for him for the Hall of Fame. Um, so I don't I don't blame him for having his say. Uh, I didn't take what Joshua said as a negative, as negative as some people made it out to be. I just, I feel like Anthony might be just at the spot he's in right now. And I, I like Anthony also, like I like Froch. They're just totally different kind of personalities, number one. I feel like Joshua's in a little bit of a position in his career where there's a little bit of frustration. Because, you know, he's lost a couple of fights. He's not champion anymore. This fight with Dylan White is not at the level of money as the recent fights he's had where he was making gigantic money. Um, and every fighter sort of looks for some type of, I don't want to say excuse, but a reason, let's say. And, uh, you know, in his mind, he does feel like maybe Rob spent a little too much time with the Olympians, not enough time with him. But I don't know if I would air that in public, even if that's how you really feel. So they had a lot of great years together. He was in the corner when, when Joshua was an amateur. He was the one that was there when he won the world title. They were there together when he won all those big fights in the, in the big stadiums, when it was against Klitschko or against uh, uh, Joseph Parker to unify the titles or any number of big fights I had together and uh, you know it didn't work out but th there's no reason to look back and negatively they had a great run Final question, Dan, uh, a fight which uh, I don't know what you think about Fury taking on Ngannou. Um, you know, uh, what have you made of that? And, you know, Eddie Hearn said, I believe, yesterday that he feels that Fury's just only interested in money at this point. He doesn't, because he's not fighting Usyk. I mean, I, listen, all due respect to my man Eddie, but what do you expect him to say? He wants his guy Joshua to get the fight with Fury, so he's saying what he thinks. If, if, if it was Tyson Fury was promoted by Matt from boxing, uh, I promise you Eddie wouldn't have those statements. I mean, that, that's just the bottom line. And I'm not, I'm not knocking Eddie for saying it. That's, you know, he's doing what he's got to do. But I, I take not just with Eddie Hearn, I take pretty much what every promoter says, often with a grain of salt. If it was Bob Arum or if it was, uh, you know, uh, Tom Brown at PBC or in TGB or if it was any other promoter, Frank Warren, Oscar De La Hoya, pick a promoter, Lou DiBella, you name it. Uh, you know, it, it, they just, they say that. And maybe he believes it, maybe he doesn't. I personally don't have a big problem with the fight because this is a hurt business. They're making big money for this fight. And if you're Fury, he's going to get paid a ton for a fight that really has very little threat compared to fighting Usyk or fighting any other top bona fide heavyweight contenders. But there's a certain segment of the public that wants to see uh, this type of fight. I don't really quite understand it. We saw it already with other fights like Mayweather McGregor most famously. 
Uh, hard not to be happy for Naganu. I don't know and I don't cover, but I've seen some interviews. He comes off like a very uh, real guy, like a, a down earth kind of guy, a humble kind of guy. He's going to make more money for this fight than if you added up the purses for every single one of his UFC fights his entire career. And you can't be happy, uh, unhappy about that. So my only quarrel, it's not that the fight's happening. If Tyson and, and, and Naganu want to go make the money, God bless them. It's that Fury spent the, the last six, eight months teasing us about every other fight under the sun and then ended up taking this fight instead of finalizing Usyk when he could have. Is it all his fault, though? Because, you know, people say, uh, you know, Usyk's camp will say that he didn't want the fight, etc. Or, but he, you know, Frank Warren and Tyson will say, well, they offered Joshua the fight. Uh, you know, they wanted the Usyk fight. Can he be blamed for all of it? Or what would you think? I mean, from what my understanding is, my, you know, I've talked to different people involved on both sides of the coin for all these matches you're talking about. I believe that they made the deal for Usyk so onerous to accept that it was his fault. I mean, there's lots of ways to not do a fight. You put a, a, a deal point on the table that's so against what the other fighter wants that they can't possibly accept it. And then when they don't accept it, you can say, well, we offered him the fight. And he didn't take the, take the fight. So I do think that in the sense of the Usyk fight, there was the sense that it was a bridge too far in terms of what the uh, split would be for the rematch. But I also, from talking to the Usyk side, their perspective, whatever you believe it or not, I tend to believe them, is if we gave in on that, then there'd be another thing they wanted. And then there'd be another thing they wanted. And where does it stop? So they felt like, in the end, that Fury really didn't want to do the fight under those circumstances. Maybe Tyson would have done the fight if he got every single thing his way. But when you negotiate, it's a negotiation. It means each side's got to give a little. And so when that fight didn't happen, again, my my perspective, and I don't, I'm not saying Tyson's a bad guy for it or anything like that. I just, I feel like if you have to cast the blame, it's more on Fury for that fight not happening than it is on Usyk. As it relates to the Joshua fight, I'll quote what Anthony Joshua said to me in an interview. He gave me like five minutes to make a decision. That's not how you negotiate. You don't, I don't know if the Brits know this line, if you've ever seen the movie Dirty Dancing, nobody puts baby in a corner. It's a famous saying in the, meaning, if you really want to make the fight, be honest, negotiate forthright, don't do it on social media, don't make ultimatums, be adults, do it behind closed doors, and you get a fight done. And I don't feel like he was truly serious about the fight at that moment in time. Well, Dan, uh, appreciate your time. Uh, tell the fans where your work's going to be uh, this week, and uh, I'll put links in the description to it as well. I appreciate that. I'm on my uh, danrayfield.substack.com, my newsletter. You sign up. It takes two seconds with your email. They want to help the cause, so I can be at great events like this and help pay the freight a little bit. There's subscriptions available for pay also, but also some good free material as well. And uh, I'm writing every day, and I appreciate it. You got your podcast as well this week? Yeah, we do our podcast twice a week. Me and my partner, TJ Reeves, the Big Fight Weekend podcast, the Fight Freaks Unite uh, recap podcast, all podcast locations, Spotify, Google, uh, Apple, you name it, it's there. And we have a good time. We have a good time doing it. Glad to hear it, Dan. Good to see you here in uh, Vegas for Spence Crawford. Uh, enjoy the fight. Thanks a lot, Jonathan.